So I, I categorically would not trust this in any way, shape or form. But I think, you know, given enough time and enough driving, I can get to a position where it could do something which I think could be, you know, borderline safe. My dad lives in Suffolk in a place called Halesworth. My mum lives in Brentwood in Essex. And this came about by the idea of, is it possible for me to drive from Suffolk to Essex? And by the time I get there, if I've captured the right data, if I went out for dinner with my mum, could I come back and the car could learn to drive itself back? So to caveat this, one of the biggest problems is data collection. So how do you collect this data? So the best way to do it is to get the acceleration, steering angle and brake data from the OBD2 port on certain cars. But this requires a specific harness. It's quite expensive, it's about 150, 200 pounds. I didn't want to do that. So how well can we do this on a budget? So I skipped the acceleration and braking and just focused on steering. And I did that on budget with an Arduino board and a webcam and this computer down here, which I SSH into to transfer the data. In theory, it would have worked. So we would have gotten the results by the time I got back to the car and then we could have seen what happened. Um, I thought this was going to be more straightforward than it was. It turned out to be a little bit tricky, um, but yes, it works, I think. And you can be the judge of that. You can see what happens in the end. We had to um, capture data on a budget. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use two things. We use my, well, three things really. We've got an Arduino board here which we'll speak a little bit about. And um, we've got my laptop and we've got a webcam, just a USB webcam. I wrote some code for this Arduino and essentially have turned it into a spirit level. So what it does is it just monitors the angle that it's positioned at. You can see the Arduino working here. If we put it flat to the table, it should read something close to zero. And if we move it around and tip it, you should be able to see the numbers going up and down. So that's one part of it. So what I did is I basically stuck that to the steering wheel of my car, the back of it. Um, so not affecting my driving, safety conscious and all of that. Um, and to caveat this, we're doing it on a budget. So it, it would only really work for 90 degrees. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit more later. So basically 90 degrees steering angle, mostly motorway driving, A roads. We're not gonna need too much of that. So I figured that was okay. And then what we do is we um, have a webcam that we put on the dashboard. Turns out the dashboard isn't the right place for this, and we'll, we will see that later, just because it takes up a little bit too much of the view. I wrote a Python script, and basically to take frames from the webcam, and via the serial port, so this connection here, uh, the Arduino and the computer, every time it took a image, it would then get the corresponding position of the Arduino board, which would attach the steering wheel. Are you using GPS or anything at this point? Nope, no GPS just vision. And that was it. So I started the drive with the laptop. So I charged it up, lasted about 80 minutes. Turns out 80 minutes was a lot of data. The goal was to do this in real time. So obviously this didn't happen. So this was a few days later. So I had this data. So these images and these labels, and I had to make one correspond to the other. So how can I get a machine tell me for this given picture, what's going on in this picture? Where should the steering wheel be in this position? We used our trusted neural networks for this. So we've got loads and loads of pictures here with numbers like 0 0.1, 0 0.6, minus 0 0.4, and zero. So zero's dead straight. So we've got these images and these corresponding labels, and we have to tie the two together. Now, one of the issues with this data set is that for most of the time, a significant proportion of the time, you're gonna be um, basically pointing straight forward. Not much is gonna happen. So you get a distribution like this. If we have minus one here and we have one here, we have a distribution which is very peaky around the zero. So this is a bit problematic. So for the really extreme angles, I just chopped it off. So we don't worry about this. If anything happens here, don't worry. Mainly motorway driving, not a problem. And then for these numbers here, so these labels, what we did is we actually squared the number to try and get this distribution a little bit flatter because the problem is it's very hard to convince a neural network not just to pick zero here because zero is right so often. How do you bias this to try and make it pay attention to what isn't zero? So the goal was to basically flatten this distribution out by doing some mathematics, essentially squaring the numbers so that it becomes a bit flatter so that the neural network can learn. So that was the first problem we had to deal with, but now the data, or at least this side of the data, the labels are um, 
correctly pre-processed. Now we can get into how we design the, the neural network to do this. So there are many ways we could do this. One of them is we could train our own network from scratch. Um, but a better way, just for speed and ease, is we're going to use the convolutional neural networks or particular ones that are pre-trained. So these are designed to recognize objects and images. So we've spoken a little bit about them before. Is there a dog in this picture? Is there a cat? Is there a car? Bus, so on and so forth. And within those networks, there's an, there is a lot of functionality for detecting objects and things and where they are in an image. Okay? And in, in that instance, it's tailored to just trying to work out if something is present. So what we do is these neural networks are built up of layers. So we have lots and lots of layers of a neural network. So I use something called MobileNet version two because it's quite good, it's quite small. Um, it does the job quite well and it trains pretty quickly because it's say not too big. So we've got MobileNet here and there's uh, another layer here. And what we do is just say, great, we like all the image processing that you do, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna chop off the bottom part of your layers. So you're not going to be doing any classification, but the features of the image and everything you've seen will be in a slightly higher form above the outputs. So we want all of that. So we're just going to cut off the bottom layer so we can get rid of this here. And then we can take this layer and then build our own custom layers here. So we build two or three custom layers. So convolutional neural network layers here and this will output a real number specifying what position it thinks the steering wheel should be in. So this is perhaps turning the raw data of the images into something the computer can comprehend that then you can choose to do something different with. Yeah, so what it's doing is it's, to do this manually, as in to hard code everything, we'd have to do an awful lot of image processing. It's got that image processing inherently in it, and we want that. We don't care about the classification. We don't care what's in the image, we just care kind of where things are and what's, what's gonna happen. So. This was the form of the network, so um, mobile net version two, cut off the bottom layers, append some of our own. And what that actually means is when all this is training, because there was an awful lot of data here, what actually happens is we don't have to train the whole network, really. We can just train our bottom layers, which means it's a lot quicker, we can get results faster, and for someone who's got very little patience for these sort of things, that's really, really great. It took about, about 12 hours to train, so it had to be a really long lunch and you'd have to be coming back very late if you plan to do it all in one day. But we, we did get some results. So I actually used this. Um, an another way which you could do this, which I did, is I used small videos instead of images. And small videos I thought were great because it gives you an idea about the direction of travel over time. So instead of an image, you really don't know how fast you're going in the image when you just see one thing. But if you see several images, you can work out sort of velocities and if you're accelerating, decelerating. And I created a much more complicated network to analyze these. It didn't seem to work as well. Similar results, but it just took a lot more training time. Um, and it was overall uh, just not a productive thing to be doing. So single images, just feeding in single images to the network seemed to be the most effective way. Does it work? It definitely works. Would I trust it? No, but it's, it's doing something slightly different. So typical cars that do lane keeping, which is approximately what this is, is they look at the lines on the road and try and identify where they are. Now, we're not doing that directly. We're just saying, here's an image that we, we give to the network, which position should the steering wheel be in? So in that sense, so having driven cars that just do the lane detection and look for the lines, um, sometimes they get confused. They get confused quite easily if the lines aren't particularly there. With this, the one thing about it is it should be robust. It should robustly keep you on the road and robustly drive you into a hedge whenever it wants, but it won't lose track of what's going on. It's always gonna be trying to be engaged and, and, and driving. When I was training the data, I removed some sequences from the data set. So we've got basically 10 second sequences and I think we've got 20 of them. And I use that separately. So once we've got the training data, which is used to train the network, and we've got the validation data, which is used to understand when the network has finished training. And we've got the test data to get a number out saying how good the network's performing. That number is actually a bit meaningless here because you don't really know what it means. You only kind of know if it's working by uh, applying it to some data it hasn't seen before. Because of authenticity, we're going to be showing what the network saw. The quality is rubbish. <laughs> when using um, these pre-trained neural networks, 
uh, they have a specific size of image that they take and it's 244 by 244 and that's actually quite small. So the video that we're going to see now detailing how well things worked, um, the image is the image quality is particularly low because that's the quality of the image uh, the network took and I thought it would be disingenuous to spruce it up and make it really clear because uh, that's not really what the network saw. So in this video we've got a blue square down at the bottom and this indicates to what extent we should be turning left versus turning right. So obviously when the blue square is far over to the left that means sort of a hard left and far over to the right means a, means a hard right. And we can, we can now discuss how well you think it did. So this is pulling away from a junction. You can see that it, I think it's fair that we should be turning left there. It's doing appropriately. Uh, and then turning right now, again we're quite happy with that. There's a bit of a delay there where it wants to pull you into the verge. but. Aside from that, it's definitely learning something appropriate towards driving. This clip, not too much interest in going here, leading slightly to the right. So one of the issues with this is using the Arduino, which is like a spirit level. If the road is at an angle, that's obviously not the best for perfect science. But for this road, a little bit to the right, I think we're, we're happy there. And this, this is a clip actually from Halesworth. So this is one of the very first ones. And you can see turning to the left, keeping it in the middle for this point and then slowly going towards the right. I'm, I'm quite happy with that. I mean, I, I don't, I wouldn't trust it, but you know, it's, um, it's definitely learning something appropriate. Well, considering you're doing this as a bit of a side hobby and there are, there are yeah. teams of people in California devoting, <laughs> having just got back from San Francisco and seen actual driverless cars driving around the streets, which is very strange. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, this is good. Um, yeah, I think with you know a lot more time, a lot better camera placement, it will be interesting to see how good this could get. But I was pleasantly surprised by the first attempt. As I say here, this is just driving on the motorway. There's not much to be doing. For example, here, this is when we were talking about the bias of the numbers before. Pretty much, if you don't know what to do, keeping the steering wheel dead straight is a good guess for the neural network. If this was kind of like in conjunction with other systems, yeah. then actually you could build something quite powerful. Exactly, so if I did have the acceleration and brake data, I was thinking about this, you could build separate networks for all of them and just having them running at the same time, rather than having to put so much data into the network and doing a bit of multimodal learning. So with this, we never actually know what it's doing or why it's doing what it's doing. So interestingly, I think a large part of this is it's learning to follow the car in front. That's a very sensible thing to do. So it'll be very interesting to see what it does when there's no traffic around. I mean, here's a clip. Now, I guess there is a car in the, in the far distance, but it does seem to be, it seems like a bit of a right turn there. Yeah, that seems appropriate. So it looks to be doing a little bit more than that, but we never truly know. So it could be looking for road markings, it could be looking for trees, grass verges, cars, we'll never know. So the only way to really test it is to kind of look at it and go, <laughs> yeah, that's all right. So I, I categorically would not trust this in any way, shape or form. But I think, you know, given enough time and enough driving, I get to a position where it could do something which I think could be, you know, borderline safe, um, which is for a budget project with an Arduino, a laptop and a webcam and half the screen cut off through bad placement of the webcam. I think that's pretty, pretty optimistic. Who knows what next? You know, flying planes or something like that. So if people wanted to have a play with the codes, is that Yep, cool? absolutely. So um, I like things like this because they are quite playful. So all you really need are you need some images and some corresponding labels. And I've, uh, I can link the, uh, I can put a link on to my personal website so you can see the GitHub repository on there. So on the top right hand corner, there's a GitHub and you can play around with this code. I've got the Arduino code on there. I've got the code to capture the images alongside the Arduino output through the serial port. Um, that's for the data capture side, and I've got the machine learning side of it as well, um, which you can use there. Um, just for silly ideas, and I do love a good silly idea. If this worked appropriately, there is no reason I could think as to why if you didn't strap a webcam to quite a powerful remote control car, put it to dashboard height,